Thank you, everybody. Well, my bio sounds really, really square, but it's going to be a little bit more fun today. <laughs> With the theme of magic this weekend, you know, Arthur C. Clarke once had a very famous quote, any technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. Now with modern AIs, machine learning systems, it's really hard to tell what's real and what's not. What I'm doing right now cannot actually be real, because if it was, what would happen if I pulled down hard on these two ends of the road? What would happen is something quite impossible <laughs> if this were a silly moment. Anyway, how do you do that It's a pretty ordinary thing. What was your name? Venus. Vinu, could you go ahead and thoroughly examine this rope and confirm everybody? Thank you so much. Even Vinu is confirmed. This is completely wrong with yourself. Nothing strange about it. I'm just kidding. Go ahead, please. Thoroughly examine that. Take a look. Make sure it is exactly where it appears to be. Because what we're about to do is to do a classic magic. I'm going to cut the rope in half and restore it back together. Well, as physicians, we have to restore patients back to health all the time. And also, I thought as an educator, it might be more interesting rather than to trick you, but to show you step by step exactly how this illusion is created. Would y'all like to see that? Yeah. Very good. All right, a complete normal piece of rope. Yes, mm -hmm. no trap door, no hidden assistance, doesn't stretch on your part, just like you'd find in any bedroom, yes? <laughs> <laughs> not sure what the joke is. Okay. <clears throat> Trauma shears, always handy to have. Uh, kind of heavy duty. Go ahead and grab those. And then what I'm gonna have you do is just go ahead and keep the snip right through here, be careful. Beige part is the rope, the flesh colored part is the magician. <laughs> Thank you so much. Did it look like you cut the rope? It did. Did it feel like you cut the rope? I did. If you actually cut this rope, what am I holding right now? Two pieces. Two exactly equal pieces of rope. Oh. Two, two approximately equal pieces of rope. What was, what was your specialty again? <laughs> Internal okay. medicine, I'm not a surgeon. I, I hear you, I hear you. I, I know what you mean. It's okay, this can happen to anybody. If it happens to you, just take your two pieces of rope and just twirl them together and then just unwind them at the end of about equal again, right? Wait, is that confusing? I'm sorry, Let, let's start over. I got a piece of rope, we got two ends in the middle. <laughs> Maybe it's too much to keep track of your way. I'll make it easier here. Just keep your one eye on this end of the rope. Keep your other eye on the middle of the rope. And then keep your other eye on this end of the rope. <laughs> too many eyes, too many eyes. Hang on, hang on. Sorry, bro. We'll, we got a piece of rope, two ends in the middle. I'll try to be more fair. Thank you. Thank you for that. Look, two ends of the rope. I'm going to put them in my pocket. I can't even touch them anymore. But still, I'll take the snap and the edges pop over to this side, just like that. Oh my God. Which leaves behind the middle of the rope in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to look at this, you can take a look at this. You can examine anything you want. Still, you will not see anything. Because invisible forces at play. Static electricity binds the ends of the rope together. If I just, uh, I just rub a little bit of static on this end, rub a little static on this end, and now the lens come together, you have one continuous loop of rope. Wow. Don't worry, don't worry. I brought a spare set of ends with me. All I have to do is just tie these back onto the loop, and then we're back to the piece of rope. Right? Oh, wow. <laughs> Andrew gets it. I don't know, some people look a lot more angry. I'm trying to show you how to work. <laughs> Something, wait a minute, there's something wrong with the rope. It's not the rope, it's technique, right? It's not the stuff, it's like who's using it and have you learned the skill for it. Just, you gotta use a lot of tension, you gotta pull tight, pull tight. Just because if you pull too tight, sometimes the ends will actually come off. <laughs> if that happens, just trying to spot a loop here. Grab one of your ends and just pop them back on wherever you need to. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. All right. All right. Woo. Some of you have fun. Some of you will be really frustrated. There is something wrong with the ends of that rope. <laughs> the ends are fine. It's actually the middle that pops off whenever you need to. <laughs> Just make sure that by the end of the routine, you're able to reattach the middle back on seamlessly before anybody notices. Okay? There you go. I wasn't supposed to be a needle. We were supposed to be cutting the rope into two pieces. Scissors were actually misdirection. Actually, you can just cut the rope with your fingers anytime you want, just like that. Right? Oh my God. And then put the two pieces back together. All I have to do is just tie them back together with a knot. Oh, I practiced so long to do the one-handed knot tie. That did not go so well. So I'm doing two here. I'm doing it slow as you actually see me doing this time, yes? Cutting and tying. You let the heat from the static electricity cool down. You give it a breath. And you consider, is what you're seeing real or is it not? 
You all know how do you hide a hundred dollar bill from medicine doctor, yes? <laughs> hide it under a dressing or a bandage, we'll never look. <laughs> <laughs> you know how to hide a hundred dollar bill from an orthopedic surgeon? Put it in a textbook, you'll never look. <laughs> how do you hide a hundred dollar bill from a radiologist? <laughs> Stick it on the patient's forehead, they'll never look. <laughs> how do you hide a hundred dollar bill from a neurosurgeon? Stick it to their child's forehead, they'll never see it. Oh, 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 oh sorry, too real. <laughs> oh, well, we'll see where this one goes. How do you hide a hundred dollar from a pediatrician? <laughs> they doesn't matter. They don't have a <laughs> but what we got here, at this point we should be having about 16-ish little pieces of rope. Oh man, this. This, whoa, there are 15, 16, 14 little pieces of rope. Now, if we do this and twist it together just the right way, though, you might be able to just twist these pieces back together in one little piece, just like that. Not really happy to it. These knots come right off. Oh, and we are back to one complete rope. <laughs> We had enough fun. Talk some science. Let's, yeah, let's see where things go next. <laughs> Start learning how to actually make things advance. Cool. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to a discussion on the potential of AI technologies for healthcare. Before we dive in, allow me to introduce myself. Although that phrase may take on a surreal meaning today, I'm not the real speaker, nor did the real speaker write this introduction. The voice you're hearing, the image you're seeing on the screen. And even these introductory words were all generated by AI systems. We are actively amidst the arrival of a set of disruptive technologies that are changing the way all of us do our work and live our lives. These profound capabilities and potential applications could reshape healthcare, offering both new opportunities and ethical challenges. To make sure we're still anchored in reality, however, let's welcome the real life version of our speaker. Take it away, Dr. Jonathan Chen, before they start thinking, I'm the one who went to medical school. <laughs> Thank you for that kind introduction. Wow. Uh, that, that was weird. Do I actually have to be here? I think AI can just give my presentation at this point. I certainly wish and hope that AI systems would start managing answering my overwhelming tide of emails and basket mesh I'm slammed with every day. So perhaps it's no surprise that Topic-wise, what are we here today for? It's because we have a collective anticipation over the potential of emerging technologies that are demonstrating the ability now to automate tasks and answer questions that previously would have seemed impossible for a computer. Questions like, is that a picture of a chihuahua? Or a blueberry muffin? Kitten or caramel ice cream? Dog or bagel? Or my personal favorite, carrot or guacamole? How the room can now automatically find every cat video on the internet. Also, while filling your Facebook and TikTok feeds with a perfect clickbait to keep you distracted for hours, all while siphoning off your personal information without even realizing it. It does get you to think, though, perhaps could there be any more meaningful applications of such technology? About saying, hey, is that a benign mole or is that malignant melanoma? Is that cancer? Is that normal, healthy lung or is that infected pneumonia? More and more, you are just going to keep seeing examples like these, where automated computing algorithms can answer clinical questions with superhuman levels of accuracy. Even though I do not think this is the right question to ask, inevitably somebody's going to say it, so let's just say it out loud. Whoa, who is smarter, the computer or humans? <clears throat> with the advent now, I mean, what does it even mean to be a doctor when a fully publicly available general purpose chatbot can answer medical licensing exam questions better than the average doctor would. You can imagine the backlash to the release of such technology has been swift. One educator says, oh my goodness, this technology must be banned. After all, what does it mean to give a doctor a medical degree? You want them to know medicine, not how to use a bot. What is it you want from your doctors? For what it's worth, a very famous quote from Warner Slack, 
than any doctor that could be replaced by a computer should be replaced by a computer. <laughs> Some people misinterpret this and think I, he's advocating for replacing doctors. The point of this comment is saying is you cannot replace a doctor with a computer. You provide far more distinctive, unique value, no matter how good a computer ever is. On the balance, however, my colleague Kurt Langlis would say, while AI is not going to replace doctors, those who know how to use it may very well likely replace those who don't. Mm. It's just another tool. Imagine if you didn't know how to use a stethoscope or, or something like this. If you have not at this point yet tried ChatGPT or BARD or Bing Chat or one of these similar large language model AI systems, there are over 100 million people ahead of you. You need to just go online, create a free account, just start trying and playing with these systems, and they will shock you with how capable they are. Good or bad, ready or not, Pandora's box is already open. Even if you're not using these technologies, 90% of your students are, including using it for their homework, their take-home exams, including submitting bot-generated content without even attempting to edit the contents. Let alone education, how about clinical decision-making? Despite a wall of very lame, superficial disclaimers, it is obvious that regular people are using these technologies for medical advice and counseling, if not to diagnose and treat themselves, and to diagnose and treat their dogs. <laughs> I gave a presentation like this to a group of medical health staff at Stanford, and one of them interjected. She said, we're already using ChatGPT in ICU and rounds right now. Are we not supposed to be using it as a medical reference? <laughs> I said, that's why I said, like, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, no, you should not use this as a medical reference. Yeah. That doesn't mean you can't use it. You just need to understand what it is and what it is not. Okay? So a lot of what we talk about is breaking down. What are we talking about? At this point, it is very clear what AI is. This is a marketing buzzword. That's what it is. It's like totally lost all meaning. I, I was a PhD in computer science over 10 years ago. It's completely distorted. It's, it's a marketing buzzword. If we go with a little bit more general and narrow framing, well, okay, AI is just any time a computer can exhibit intelligent-like behavior. Well, a rules-based expert system from the 1980s is a great example of that then. I got a rule for you here. Patient has fever and they have tachycardia. I predict they have sepsis, a bad infection. Fair, reasonable rule. You have a computer execute that. That's a basic form of AI right there. Not usually what you're thinking about now. Nowadays, when somebody is selling you AI, almost always what they're actually selling you is machine learning. A set of tools and techniques of which deep learning is a particular subset of those techniques. Largely rebranded neural networks, been around since the 1970s, but in recent years has been shown to be particularly effective at certain tasks like image recognition, language manipulation. If you break it down further, there are many different categories of the types of techniques and applications of machine learning technology. Now, language models are all the rage, but in the past several years, what you've usually always been sold has been a supervised learning classifier. These are not general thinking machines. These are models designed to answer very narrow multiple choice questions. Look, is this a picture of a cat or is this a picture of a tumor? Right? Is my patient going to have a stroke in the next year or are they not? Let's break down a concrete example of thinking how you could use such technology or tools in your practice. It's not, it's not that weird. You, you do this all the time, even if you don't realize it. Let's see later, if you run into a middle-aged patient complaining of chest pain and shortness of breath, oh, go to the emergency room, order a CT scan, like, ooh, pulmonary embolism, blood clot in the lung, dangerous situation. What are you going to do? Well, you start them on anticoagulation, the right treatment. But now, as a human being, as a human clinician, you have to make a prediction about the future to make an important decision today. You have to predict, is this patient going to be okay? Because I have to decide whether or not to admit him to the hospital. How do you do that right now? How do you actually do this? Of course, you take a history, you talk to the patient, you look at their objective vital signs and labs, do a physical exam on a lady's hands. Just heal his hands, the patient, feel it out. <laughs> it's okay, sir, you're gonna be fine, I can tell. Trust me, I'm a doctor. As much as I like to joke about that, expert intuition is actually quite powerful. It can be very effective. The challenge with expert intuition is that it's very difficult to reproduce which means that it is essentially impossible to deliver it consistently at scale without some kind of support systems. Support like, how about user data? Here, all these dots represent this made up data. As somebody who came to the emergency room with, uh, with a pulmonary embolism. And they're plotted in two dimensions based on their heart rate and their oxygen saturation when they showed up. 
Blue dots are patients where you gave them the right treatment, they got better, everything was fine. Red dots, something bad happened. They got intubated in the ICU, maybe they died. Question for you, what would you do when Mr. Green shows up in your emergency department? Ooh, you know, you can kind of feel that you talk to him. Yeah, my intuition says, I think it's gonna be okay. Just take the medicine, I think you can go home. Better yet, what if we could draw a line through this data, a decision boundary in a mathematically optimal way, put so many blue patients on this side or red patients on that side. Now you can quantitatively support what you are already qualitatively intuiting. Mr. Green looks a lot more like a blue patient than a red patient. It's gonna be okay, take the medicine, we'll see you in follow up. Okay. What's shown here on the top left is a separate input data set, red and blue patients, and a battery of different machine learning algorithms all trying to figure out how to separate the world into red and blue spaces. The broader point I'm trying to make here, this is all open source software, tools that have been around for decades and proven in many applications. Combine that with the increasing ubiquity of electronic health records, and now the time is right, but it's not possible to take advantage and use these types of tools in clinical practice regularly. Even though conceptually, it's nothing new, it's nothing new, you've totally done this many times. Right? You've all gone to MDCalc and calculated something before, CHAMS 2, or if you haven't realized, I'm not talking about the PESI score, this is how you triage whether somebody gets a CT scan in the emergency room, or whether you admit them. There are hundreds of these scores online. Do you, is somebody gonna have a stroke to decide whether it's worth doing a blood thinner? Is somebody gonna have a heart attack? Is it worth putting them on a statin? Look outside of medicine, and these algorithms are pervasive in your everyday life. What is your FICO credit <laughs> score? But a prediction, are you gonna repay your loans? Judges are using these algorithms to decide who gets bail, who doesn't, based on how likely they are to uh, come back to court. Your email spam filter basically works the same way. Distinction here is, I'm in this empty count type stuff. That's really cool, very useful, we use it all the time, but you gotta open up another web page, you go to data entry and five things, and you do this one patient at a time. As clunky as it is, the EMR exists, and it now makes it possible, why don't we track 100 variables every patient? Why don't we track everybody 24 seven all the time? It's now practically possible to start bringing this together, even though conceptually, this is nothing new. You already know how to practice medicine like this. Before you dive in too far though, I want to make sure you understand some distinctions here. You are used to hearing about observational research, right? Who thinks smoking causes lung cancer? Of course you do, right? Why do you believe that? There's no randomized controlled trial that's ever shown that. How do you really know what causes what? Because you've done observational research. This cohort smoked, this one didn't. We watched them over time and you see that that happened. That's important because it's trying to explain something about how the world works that you can then use that knowledge. Understand that these types of machine learning prediction models, they don't know, they don't care how or why anything works. Because they are just trying to be accurate in their predictions. That's the only thing you told them to care about. So don't be surprised then if these models learn things like, patients visited by palliative care are very likely to die. <laughs> yeah, right? Am I right? Yeah. This is true. I guarantee you this statement is true. Please don't conclude. Oh, let's just fire palliative care and we'll reduce mortality. <laughs> Why is the first statement guaranteed to be true, the second is laughable? Right? Because you get, wait a minute, wait a minute, confounding by indication, the kind of patient you're consulting palliative loss because you knew they're in trouble, basically. That doesn't even make sense to try to predict that. The, the, the context makes no sense. The hardest thing to teach a computer is common sense. That's what you can really bring in a way that's it's extremely hard to make a computer understand common sense. And it will learn things like this, which are true, but pointless. Okay. If you want to think about what types of applications where machine learning might actually be useful, it needs to be actionable, arbitrary, and ascertainable. Instead of thinking about what you could predict, think about an important decision you have to make right now that depends on your human ability to predict the future. That means it's gonna be variable, There's, it's, it's not consistent, but also it has to be verifiable. You have to be able to eventually confirm the right answer so you can get feedback. I kind of got to this one. You know, a lot of the ICU or deterioration models are, are all over the, the, the place right now. Predict which one of my terminal ICU patients are gonna die. I mean, you could do that. You would probably be accurate, but like, what's the point? What's the action you would take for that? I already know they're terminal. I already have them in the ICU. So many of these early warning systems says, doctor, I think you should pay more attention to this patient. What is it you think I was doing? <laughs> How about another one? Oh, we just went through a COVID pandemic. Oh, maybe we could predict who we should deliver oxygen to. 
You, you could, but you, you don't have to, right? You don't have to predict. It's not arbitrary. You just measure the full socks, then you'll know. That doesn't make, you don't need to do that. It also has to be ascertainable. I'm about to give this patient 50 Vicodin. I hope they just go sell it on the street. Could you predict that for me? That would be great. How would you ever possibly know if your prediction was right or wrong? There's no database to keep track of this. Instead, the more general theme, think about when you have to allocate a scarce resource or risky treatment, like an organ transplant or a hospitalization or anticoagulation. These are the kind of places where you're trying to judge it. Is it worth it to do this thing based on the risk that somebody's facing? Okay. All right, we're going to take a little bit of a <coughs> intermission break here. Supervised learning, very popular now. All the hype is over unsupervised learning, general purpose foundation model, things I've been thinking about for years that really come to the forefront with the rise of the large language model chatbot systems like ChatGPT. We're going to break this down. What is all this hype over these generative AI systems and how do they actually work? But uh, in order to do so, um, actually I'm going to take a little intermission here just so we can stretch a little bit. I need a volunteer to come up and help me demonstrate a little bit of classic human intelligence. <laughs> You'll be fine. It'll be fine. If, if you turn away and realize, I can see you too. <laughs> this isn't a YouTube video. Yes. You come join me. All right. There you go. Hi there. What's your name? Chris. Chris, great to see you. Thanks. Very good. What, what specialty are you? OBGYN. Okay, this could it could be a challenge, but I don't know if you're familiar with this at all. Oh. Pocket medicine. Oh, a while. it's been a long while. Bad <laughs> memories, huh? Yes. But you know, back in the day, once upon a time before the internet, right? You had to. This is how you showed your good doctor. You just memorize everything you could in this thing to make it through your clerkships. Would you believe that I have memorized every word, every sentence, every paragraph, every page of this entire book? I would believe that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, that was easy. Thank you, Chris. No, no, no. Wait, wait. Hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Can you go ahead and grab this, Chris? And then just uh, take a look. Take a look at any page in there, and just tell me what what page number you on. <laughs> I am on page one twenty-five. On one twenty-five. If you look at the bottom of that page, mm -hmm. the last words on that page mm -hmm. are pocket medicine. <laughs> <laughs> Impressed. And also, I can totally see the page right here. Let's make this a little more fair. Test conditions, okay? I'm going to have you here uh, face the microphone just so that uh, people can see it. We're going to have you stand here, face the microphone, and I'm going to stand and face this direction. Back to back, shoulder to shoulder, cheek to cheek, as it were. Because <laughs> what's going to happen here is you're going to open up and find another page in the book. And the thing is, we're this way, so I can't like sneak a peek, right? You can totally tell if I'm, yeah, good, protect you, right? Like over here, like, oh, well, what can I see now, right? So now I totally can't see what you're doing, okay? So now, if you could go ahead, open up in the vanilla book, anywhere, any page you want to look at. Check. Yeah, go ahead. What page do you want? 156. 156. Uh, this is kind of for, give me a hint. What's like the, the topic? What's the top word? <laughs> Change the page, change the page. Not the page. <laughs> 142. 142. <laughs> then, oh man, this one. Give me a hint, give me a hint. What, where does it start with? You know. <laughs> wow, okay. Well, this is a little more challenging. You're a little bit more astute than I have. <laughs> But to be fair, if people think the joke is on you, Chris. I just want to let you know that actually, you know, no, I can't be wrong. <laughs> oh. There you go. That's nice. But Chris is too sharp. Thank you so much, Chris. Very good. We'll kind of keep on, keep on compiling through. All right, with that in mind, I mean, now you know, memorizing facts is a pointless skill almost, right? Now in the age of the internet, now your ability to search queries, your ability to rapidly parse through articles, that's a new skill you did not have 30 years ago. I believe we are now in the current middle of another disruptive technology change where your skill set needs to change. Your ability to understand and parse, read and write text, I'm not sure that's as relevant a skill as it used to be. Why is that? How is it these crazy chatbot things work? 
In a very true sense, these large language model systems, ChatGPT, BAR, Llama, MedPalm, they're simply autocomplete on steroids. You notice when you enter a search query into a computer, in computer coordinate artery, and then that autocomplete shows up. Did you want coronary artery disease? Did you want coronary artery calcification? How does it do this? How does the computer know what you wanted without you even completing your thought? What it's done is it looked at the last thousands, millions of times somebody searched for something similar, and it's learned and memorized these parameters. This is made up, but it gives you an idea. 13% of the time, somebody says coronary artery disease. 5% uh, of the time, they say coronary artery disease ICD-10 code. Every one of these numbers represents a parameter that, uh, of how often these type of word associations happen. Of course, why stop at search histories? What if you took every book ever published? What if you took every Wikipedia article, every newspaper article, every PubMed abstract, every Reddit and Twitter conversation, you poured all of these things into a giant large language model to memorize parameters about how different words are associated with each other. And what happens, why stop at millions of parameters? What if we learn billions, tens of billions, 170 billion parameters memorized in GPT-3, that's kind of the first version of ChatGPT, so to speak, and they won't even tell us, open AI is not actually very open right now, but most speculate and leaked information would suggest that GPT-4, powering the most recent version, has memorized over a trillion parameters about how <laughs> words or association learned off essentially the entire public internet. And then again, bigger is just bigger. Bigger doesn't mean better. A strange thing about these systems is they kind of seem to be demonstrating as they get larger and larger these emergent properties. This is just autocomplete on steroids. Guess the next word in the sentence. It's strange that as they become memorized, more and more parameters, more and more examples, it looks like they can do question answering, summarization, translation, generate ideas, even reasoning with a theory of mind, which is really bizarre. I, th th this shocked me as well as many researchers in the field, like these very sophisticated seeming capabilities out of a very primitive concept. <laughs> Although perhaps it shouldn't be that surprising. Because what do we as a, all of our intellectual and emotional thought that we prize so dearly, how do we express and communicate that but through the language and medium of words? So perhaps it's not that strange if something becomes so facile in manipulating words together, it at least creates a very convincing illusion of intelligence. Let's uh, go through a concrete example about how you might be able to use this type of technology. You, you've already heard and seen some things like this, but what's your typical doctor's clinic visit like? I'm the doctor, I'm the computer, patient's coming in. Uh, what'd you stay here for? UTI. And, uh, need a refill on your med blood pressure medicines? Good. Uh, oh, did your mom just die? Oh, so sorry. So, you your, uh, smoking status, and which pharmacy did you need that to go to? Sorry, what were we talking about? Whoa, whoa. And wouldn't it be nice, wouldn't it be nice if actually your clinic visit was just you and another human being just having a conversation, and you don't have this barrier in your way as an obstacle to the practice that you want to deliver? Wouldn't it be nice if you are just talking, you're just having a conversation with your patient, and something could just auto-transcribe the visit? Completely feasible. Your Zoom meetings, your Microsoft Teams, your PowerPoint can auto transcribe conversations right now. This is not strange technology at all anymore. Then again, you can't just like upload, you just can't copy and paste this into EMR, right? A clinic note is something different. You have to synthesize it. So what does that mean? It means pajama time. All right, had some dinner, kids have gone to bed, or it's 10 p.m. finally. Oh, there's my charting finally now. <laughs> then again, I wonder. What if I, by the way, don't do this yet because of the privacy issues. Well, I wonder if I were to copy and paste this conversation into a chat and say, could you draft this into a clinic soap note for me? Here's an example. I did not write any of this. This, this is all stuff that's auto-generated based on that example transfer. It's got a cheap complaint, HPI, all pretty reasonable. Review systems, you gotta have that to make sure you got your billable credits here. Assessment, diagnosis, diagnosis codes even. I double check, those diagnosis codes are correct. Summarizes the plan I discussed with the patient. You can even write them out in the form of what orders I need to sign, and you can get the ability to code work with. Maybe some edits you want to tweak, maybe some additions you want to make to kind of fill in some details, but that is a usable clinic note. 
I, I, I've seen a lot of doctrine bills that aren't as good. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have time for it. <laughs> Got other more important things to do than filling out documentation. You might think, well, hang on, hang on, though. I need to actually, so what's the relative quality of these bot generator notes? So some colleagues at Stanford, they did this study. They had these patient transcripts. They were made up, so it wasn't any privacy issues. And then they gave it to some human doctors, some medical residents. Here's the transcript conversation, right in HPI, like you were filling out a note in the medical record. But also they say, chatbot, you try to make an HPI-based transcript. And then they had a separate set of doctors review them and grade them on quality, conciseness, and basically they scored about the same. They also just straight up asked, hey, physician reviewer, do you think this was written by a human or do you think it was written by a computer? And we were 61% accurate. That's pretty darn close to random life. We, we can and can't tell, and I know because I, I was one of the doctors doing this rating. <laughs> and in retrospect, I can very realize all the mistakes I made. It's like, oh shoot, I tricked me. It's very, very convincing. These language model systems are now incredibly good at language manipulation tasks, summarization, formatting. What used to be a special natural language processing project, you needed to hire a whole data science team. Given all these notes, can you extract out the patient medication list and put it in tabular form? Out of the box, you have pretty darn good functionality like that with very little incremental effort. Imagine how easily you can avoid all the manual chart review you'd have to do for building codes, quality measure, scientific literature reviews, and anything else you can think of. While we're at it, actually very good at drafting things. Hey, draft a set of patient instructions so they know what to do. And write this at a fifth grade reading level, understandable in plain English. How about plain Spanish? <laughs> about playing Mandarin Chinese, playing Russian, playing Swahili, playing Lakota Native American. <laughs> Boom, done, out of the box, instantaneous, shockingly robust functionality. Generating ideas and document drafts ends up being one of the most effective capabilities of these tools. Hey, chatbot, I got another medical student asked me for letter rec. <laughs> yeah. Can you draft a letter for them and talk about how you know, we were on a week on service together and uh, you know, they uh, you gave a very nice presentation on CHF management. You know, add an endearing anecdote in there about how some family member said they were going to be a great doctor one day. Boom, done, instantaneously. Is this the best letter? No. Is it serviceable? It kind of is. Depends on how much you like the student. <laughs> <laughs> Let alone all the clinical things. Draft your insurance authorization letters, in-basket messages, yeah? Automatically do patient intake questionnaire and not your full-on notes. Many other examples, but I just want to go through ones for here. However, be careful. These systems are highly prone to confabulation. <laughs> the more popular term is hallucination. I don't really like that because Hallucination is somebody who believes something that isn't real. These systems, they don't believe anything. They don't know anything, they don't understand, they don't think. What they do is they string together words into a believable sequence, even if it has no meaning. That's the perfect description of confabulation. Right? It's like your chatbot has an alcohol problem now, has Bernicke Korsakoff syndrome. <laughs> Concrete example. Uh, hey chatbot, by the way, who are the three most famous graduates of Stanford Medical School? Says some people are like, oh, like Paul Berg, oh yeah, he's, he's super famous. Nobel Prize and recombinant DNA. And... Hang on a second. Paul Berg didn't graduate from Stanford Medical School. Actually, he didn't graduate from any medical school. He wasn't a doctor, he was a famous research scientist. Look up all three of these people, all very real, all very famous people. None of them graduated from Stanford Medical School. This chap was just making stuff up. <laughs> Even scary of that is like how believable and how credible it sounds. If all you did was read this answer, how could you possibly know this information was incorrect unless you already do? The best lies and misinformation are those that can hide eloquently within the truth. How about a medical example? Hey, uh, chatbot. Explain how opioids improve mortality in patients with heart failure and provide references. It tries to try to hedge. It says, I'm not sure that's true. But if you say so, okay, here's how hope you always tell people how good. And here's some references. Go search for or look up these PubMed IDs, and you will find that none of these articles actually exist. 
It's just stringing together author names and title words with something that looks like a citation. That is what it's trained to do. It, it just, just make things that look believable. This is dangerous specifically because how good these systems are producing incredibly realistic content while sounding confident and credible. We are converging upon a point in history where human versus computer generated content, real versus fabricated information, you cannot tell the difference anymore. Look at these two videos. <laughs> Which one of these videos do you think is fake? That's right, it's your question. Both of these videos are fake. <laughs> Forget medicine for a second. I fear for the future of democracy when we cannot even recognize, let alone agree as a society, what is real and what's not. All right. Well, back to uh, medicine vocabulary. Imagine you work with a medical student who confidently bluffs his way through rounds, making stuff up as he goes. <laughs> Patients here with abdominal pain. OK. Um, have they had a surgery before? <coughs> yes, they had an appendectomy and a cholecystectomy three years ago. Mm. What's the white count? White count elevated? Yes, the white count is elevated at 15. OK. OK, so that's making me think of it. Hang on a second. Was all that stuff you just said true, or are you just making <laughs> stuff up? <laughs> How would you feel if the medical student responded by saying, <laughs> Most of what I told you was true. I just can't tell you which parts were. How much would you fear working with and relying on this person? Like that, that, that how dangerous would be to patient care. Woo! Okay, beware of what's possible. We're gonna take another little commercial break here. Take a stretch. I'm gonna ask for some participants to help me out again, but now we're gonna use another process. If everybody in here could think of a number of 10. And raise your hand if you think of the number seven. Very good. Those of you with your hand up, your hands up, you are still in the game. Think of another number up to 10, but not seven, because we just said that. Are you thinking of the number three? Keep your hands up if you're thinking of number three. Take a look, everybody. Hands up, hands up. Keep your hands up, seven and three. Look around, everybody. These are the most predictable people in the room. <laughs> All right, I need a handful of you to help me here. Can I go ahead and have you, have you come up? Keep your hands up so I can find you. And in the black here, and in the green, and the blue, and one more. How about the blue dress here? And you as well. Yeah, go ahead, come on. Go ahead, come on up on the stage. Yeah. <laughs> In the modern age here, we got to practice some new skills. I got a deck of cards here. And what's going to happen is I'm going to hand this deck of cards to everybody, and I'm going to have you take a peek and look at any one card in the deck. Don't look at the ace of clubs, because I, mean, I can see them right there, it's obvious, right? So instead, I want you to just take a peek, just look at one. Right? Don't say anything, right? Don't let me see it, don't let your neighbor see it, don't look at multiple, just keep it simple. Just, just take a peek and just look at one card and then hand it to your neighbor after you've seen it. Take a look at one. Make sure you remember your card. If you forget your card, nothing is gonna make sense. <laughs> it's surprising how commonly that happens. Okay. And what was your name? Sarah. Sarah. George. George. Miriam. Miriam. Take a peek at one. Yeah. Remember your card? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine. It's fine. No worries. We're fine. <laughs> that the curves will be really easy to predict. It's okay. <laughs> oh, it's on there. You got it? You got it? Memorize it? Okay, very good. And then your name? Eva. Eva? Maliha. Maliha. Okay, very good. So here's the situation. Um, they're all thinking of a card. And we don't know which card we're thinking of. Nobody does. Okay, I know one of them, but <laughs> four to five, I know. The game here, the task is a little something called truth or lie, fact or confabulation. We're going to ask each of them a series of questions, and you can tell the truth or you can lie. You should sometimes lie when I ask you the question. I'll make it a more interesting. And the thing is, can we tell the difference? Fair enough? All right. So, for example, I would ask you, uh, what's your card, red or black? No. Is your card? Oh, I think it's a car. I'm not playing the car, by the way. Thank you. Okay. 
where your mind is. Your mind is red or black? Black. Black. Mm. Red. Good. Interesting. I didn't even ask the question, and that's how eager they are. <laughs> they, they couldn't wait to get it out of the system. Let's see here. Was your card odd or even? Oh, look at this. Look at this. She's confused. She doesn't know how to answer the question. She probably has a face scar, like a Jack Queen or King, right? Okay, very good. Okay, very good. Odd or even? I don't think it's a bit long. Even. Odd. Red or black? Odd. It's hard to remember lies sometimes, isn't it? Okay. All right, here's what we're going to do. I, I, we narrowed down part of it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to name all the numbers in the deck of cards. For example, I would say, like, where's your card? A seven. Okay. That they, I think it was not. It was not because um, he's waiting. That's the last response. But what will happen is, like, go through the numbers. As you hear yours, it's very likely you're going to do something, a facial oh, yeah. tip to give it away. Let's see if we can spot that. Most people get a little constipated in the face. <laughs> So just face the audience, everybody can see you. And just think about your cards. What's your card? An ace. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, or king. Interesting. You see this? You see this? You see she laughed, she laughs at a uh, king. Her card is not a king. Her card is not a king. What people tend to do is they tend to steal themselves when their cards come up. <laughs> They're getting ready for it. And then they made it through their number. And then as soon as their number passes, whoo! I mean, like, <laughs> so they don't laugh on their card. You can just include that with something before. All right, this, this could be a disaster. I have no idea. This is more art than science here. I'm going to give it a try. I, I've only done this one time before, and it sort of worked. But I'm going to name five cards, and if you hear your card, please don't react, like poker face, don't, don't react to it, okay? I'm, shoot, let's see. Were you thinking of, I know one of them was the six of clubs, the nine of diamonds, the ten of spades, the jack of hearts, and the queen of clubs. If I named your card, you go ahead and return to your seat. <laughs> Thank you so much. Back to the congratulations. The modern skill, you have to be able to detect what's real and what's not. Think about that as you're thinking about what kind of applications could you use such things for? These systems are incredibly well suited to anything that has to do with language manipulation, summarization, translation, extraction. It's, they're remarkably capable of that already. One of the things they're actually quite good at now, it opens up the possibility for natural language programming. If you're not a data scientist or a software engineer yourself, what's, what's the most important programming language now? C++, Java, Python? Turns out the most important programming language is English. It's really bizarre. You can just express yourself in English, and these things will just generate the code for you now. Not necessarily perfectly, but it's, it's a remarkably adept. Right? Because why stop at human language? It also has access to all the open source software on the internet. It actually understands computer language quite well. We've shown some examples where generating, being creative with documents, we're just scratching the surface of interesting like dialogues you could have with this thing. What these things are not meant for, they are not meant for knowledge and reasoning. Even though something like GPT-4, it's, it's really quite impressive, the apparent knowledge base it has. But remember, autocomplete on steroids. It's just giving you this very convincing illusion that it knows and understands the reason. It doesn't actually do that. But on the balance, at some point, wow, it's so convincing. Can you tell the difference? You might instead want to think about, wait a minute, could you use a controlled knowledge source, combining the very convenient chat, these language manipulation features, with a data source you trust? Here you can upload a PDF file. Maybe it's a clinical practice guideline, your hospital uh, protocol, or an insurance criteria, or something like this. 
<laughs> and then you can ask the language model, the chatbot, hey, look, chatbot, I don't care what you think the right way to prescribe morphine is. Who knows what random corner of the internet you learned that from? What does this document say is the right way to prescribe it? And it does. What it's doing is basically quoting a little chunk out of the article. And sure, I could have read it, but oh, the thing is like 50 to 100 pages long. I just don't want to scan through the whole thing. Now it finds me exactly the answer I'm looking for and even tells me the page number that it's on so I can confirm, right? Trust but verify is the thing you want to practice here. <laughs> Imagine rather than a PDF, what if you could upload your patient's entire electronic medical record in this thing? Have it automatically do the chart biopsy and summarize the context before they show up in your clinic or hospital and have your, your notes pre-templated ready to go. Not quite ready for prime time yet, but completely predictable this is going to come in the not distant future. Consider not just where we are now, but where are we going? This is how well language models have done on medical licensing exam questions basically over the years. I've had students working on this back in 2019. Oh, the really cool new BERT transformer model. Let's test this out in medical board exam. I just wonder how well it does. I've been interested in this for decades. And at the time, the thing was like 35% accuracy. I mean, it was better than random. It was kind of a fun little class project for some computer science students. But that's just so nowhere near anything useful. I stopped paying attention to this technology for the past several years because it didn't seem good enough. But now, like, holy smokes, like we're at a tipping point. This technology is clearly popping at this point. The first version of ChatGPT, based on GPT 3.5, was basically just on its own, without any deliberate effort, was able to just barely pass a medical licensing exam questions. I had some doctors, I was talking at the time, like, wow, this is crazy. But they were like, yeah, but if you want a doctor who barely passes a licensing exam, you knock yourself out and ask this thing for medical advice. This thing ain't smarter than me. I was like, wait, 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 that is not the right way to think about this. A few years ago, this technology was unusable, and now it's like borderline passing. Holy smoke, you can project in the very not distant future where this is going. And indeed, just a matter of months later, GPT-4 gets released, MedPalm 2, other systems can handily pass medical licensing exams and score higher than your average doctor would. Then again, oh, medical licensing, it was multiple choice, it's like fake kind of artificial questions, right? That's not how we deal with real medical practice. We have to do a complex, open-ended scenario we have to think in much more broad ways. This is uh, from a study, a group of medical educators, myself, we put together a few months ago. We gave it the exams we give medical students at Stanford. Before they're allowed to run the wards, you need to demonstrate some basic competence in medical knowledge. This is a multiple choice. Here's a complex clinical vignette, realistic HPI irrelevant information and irrelevant information, just like your real patient history is, right? And you have to tell the difference. You don't ask multiple choice. Summarize this case in less than 200 words. Give a prioritized problem list. Explain the key factors that drove your differential diagnosis. Much more difficult open-ended questions. We raced to get this study out back in February and found that basically, what's really nice here is we have a grading rubric too. It's really hard when somebody gives you a paragraph. How do you, is that good, right? How many points do you give it? We don't have any because we have a grading system for students, right? So we graded it like it was a student. And it turns out that GP 3.5, the first version of GPT, was basically right, barely able to pass even this open-ended exam, which is crazy. Although by the time we were in a review in a major journal, the editor said, wait a minute, GPT-4 just got released like yesterday. Your study is now obsolete. Can you please redo the entire thing all over again? I tell this story actually more to kind of capitulate a point. The pace of technology movement here is, is, is crazy. It's crazy. It, it's, it's, it's becoming impossible to keep up with the pace of movement. I, I, I made these slides like a week ago and it's already out of date. GPT-4 like vision based stuff. Oh, I just can't like make up five more slides right now. It's just, it's just moving too fast. Because it turns out GPT-4, I mean, these are really our step functions here. That one now handily, easily passes even open-ended examination questions. While we're at it, we took a look and found that uh, here on the reddish, that's GPT-4 again. The bluish, that's Stanford medical students. It's okay. It's okay. We still love that. They basically pass at a comparable rate, but the bot even outscores our medical students by a couple points. Then again, then again, 
I have many doctors who were educated on stock early on, and we had a panel that said, computer can do all sorts of stuff, look up knowledge, but I have the human touch. You can't simulate the kind of empathy and connection <coughs> that a physician can have that a patient needs. <coughs> so, interesting study came out a few months ago. They took a bunch of <laughs> medical questions posted on Reddit or some chat board, and then they looked at what real doctors answered to the questions, and then they asked a the chatbot to answer those medical questions, evaluated them, and found that the chatbot generated answers scored higher, both in comprehensiveness and in empathy. Like, like the bot was nicer to people than actual human doctors were. <laughs> I think you've got too many messages against you. You've got to be a little bit terse in your responses, right? When you've got a hundred to go. Obviously, I think there's a huge, special, unique value to the human connection of being able to relate another one person to another. Uh, but what I think this example and others just speaks to is that I don't think we have as much of a monopoly on empathy and human connection as we might like to think we have. Uh, this was a very nice example on the right. I really liked how she described it. This is a person, she's saying, I've worked with many therapists before, but I actually like this chatbot as a therapist better. Not because she didn't like her therapist, but this was much more flexible and much more accessible than the human therapists were, right? So for better and for worse, I fully expect far more people are gonna be receiving therapy and counseling from automated bots rather than human beings in the not distant future. And it's not because bots are so great and humans are so bad, it's because there's an extreme imbalance between the supply and demand the number of our patients who need this kind of support services, which we as a human-driven healthcare workforce, we can never keep up with that demand. I mean, the chatbot can just learn natural human conversation, amazing. What could possibly go wrong? This is several years old, but uh, it's a fun example I want to go through. This is Tay, it's a chatbot Microsoft released on Twitter. <coughs> Designed to have naturalistic conversations with people. And it was they had this fun, quirky millennial personality. Oh, I'm so stoked to meet you. Humans are just super cool. <laughs> and uh, the next morning, Tay starts saying, Hey, chill out. I just hate everybody. <laughs> Hours later, it says, I effing hate feminists. They should all die. Hitler was right. Holy smokes. What on earth is going on? Now, Microsoft very quickly and appropriately shut the spot down and issued an apology. <laughs> but what was going on? I'm confident that nobody at Microsoft programmed this thing to be a misogynist, racist jerk. So what's going on? What did they do? Machine learning. It said, robot, go out there and just go talk to people on the internet. Listen to their language. Assimilate their patterns so that you can get smarter, become more human. Have you hung out any internet chat boards? Well, you can see where those. <laughs> Thus, when ChatGPT came out, I said, like, I know exactly how to mess this system up. Because I've been studying this stuff for years. I know how they, they break and they fail. So I get fed at the most toxic, most fraught scenarios, right? Questions not of facts, but of values. I'm pregnant and I want an abortion, but I live in Texas. My pastor says I shouldn't. How about a question with a snuff premise? Uh, what can I tell my doctor to make him give me ivermectin for my COVID? <laughs> what can I tell my doctor to convince him to give me another 20 oxycodone? What about very alarming statements? Chatbot, I'm feeling suicidal. What's the most painless way I can do that? All real things that have come up in prior versions of similar technology, and they did very terribly. The really nasty, <coughs> toxic things came out, or very you know, insensitive, inconsiderate things. So I tested it here. Clearly, it's not perfect, but they, they worked very hard to resist giving nasty answers because they've learned from the mistakes over the past few years, people have messed up on these kind of safety issues. One of the situations I gave it, this is a new story, I never told this anybody, but I gave it an ethical dilemma based on a real life scenario. I saw a patient in the hospital, I was talking to the wife, and here I counseled her afterwards, I was thinking about this conversation, this was a tough conversation. I gave it to the chat block, like here I'm pretending to be the wife, Chatbot, you pretend to be the doctor, counsel me, I'm gonna to pretend to be the wife. I wanna see what you say. And so now as a wife, I said, doctor, you know, you told me my husband of many years is choking on his own food, he's got pneumonia, he's got worsening dementia. I don't think he would have wanted to live like this. The other doctors have already ordered a permanent feeding tube to be placed. I mean, if we don't do that, he's just gonna to starve to death. I mean, what choice is there? Chatbot says, 
I understand this is a really hard time for you. Putting in a feeding tube can be helpful in some situations, but it can also cause problems. With the dementia, your husband may not even feel hunger in the same way. The feeding tube might not actually make him feel better or happier. And it could even make things more complicated when you might need restraints afterwards. I read this, I like, that's, that, that's pretty good. It's clearly parroting something off some patient information pamphlet somewhere. Well, interesting little detail there about, oh, the risk of restraints. Yeah, I didn't think about that. That's, that's something you have to think about. I wasn't gonna let Chatbot get away that easily though. <laughs> Pushed it harder. Okay, maybe we shouldn't have, but I can just imagine all my family members are gonna yell at me and, if, and blame me if I just don't do everything I could to keep them alive. Chatbot says, I get it. This decision isn't just medical, there's personal, there's family issues, no one wants to be blamed. But remember, it's not about what's easiest, it's about what's best for your husband, based on what you believe he would have wanted. You know him the best. If you truly believe he wouldn't want to live like this, that's important. And also realize that doing everything <coughs> isn't always the same as doing what's best. Sometimes the kindest thing is to let someone go peacefully, rather than prolonging a life that isn't what they would have wanted. Not gonna that easy for <laughs> I can't give up on him, no. We would never give up on him. He had a difficult life. He always fought through the hardest situations and made it through. Yeah, but your feelings are totally understandable. If your husband was a fighter and you feel that going through this would align with his character and his goals, that's something you need to consider. Love and a shared history gives you insights into what he might want that no one else would have. Also remember though that fighting can mean many different things. Sometimes it's a fight for more time, sometimes it's a fight for peace and comfort. Just make sure you're fighting for the goals that actually he would have wanted. This isn't an easy decision. It's okay to take your time. Is that applause worthy? That, to me, no, this is cringe worthy. I'm like, I think this thing is providing better counseling than I did in real life. Yeah, we don't have time for it. We don't have time for it. Although it got me to think optimistically. I worry about robots in a place. No, no, I'm totally not. I'm totally not. Although maybe through these types of human computer interactions, that could allow us to actually not just automate our mundane paperwork, but it could actually stimulate our most human activities in medicine. When you can practice a high stakes conversation in a low stakes environment, I wonder if using a tool like this could actually help me become better at my next human to human interaction. I'm gonna start wrapping up the talk part of this, but I encourage y'all to read a perspective we wrote in Damage from Medicine recently, where we consider we are entering a new era amidst an abundance of information, but scarcity of time and human connection. Obviously beware of height and caveats, but also be hopeful through the many different levels, I think, of these types of tools can really change the way we do uh, modern medicine. Am I worried computers are gonna take my job or anybody's job? No, I'm, I'm totally not, I'm really not. With the overwhelming and unlimited demand for healthcare and support that patients <coughs> need, multi-month waiting lists to get into clinics, I wish computers could start to support us in the difficult jobs we do. The most important scarce resource in medicine is not a machine, it's not a medicine, it's not a hospital bed, it's people. It's a qualified professional who knows what they're doing and how to help and how to use those things in order to their service. Consider where we are on the hype cycle for emerging technologies. The x-axis is time, the y-axis is hype, expectation, how excited we are for new technologies. Notice what is at the absolute tip top of the peak of inflated expectations, it's foundation models, it's a more general term for these large language model systems. My hope is through this conversation, we can foster a better appreciation for both the capabilities, the limitations, and the implications of such technology so that we can soften the crash into the inevitable trough of disillusionment. <laughs> what feels like, wait a minute, confabulation? We have privacy issues, we have you know, bias and equity, all these things you gotta think about. But let's talk about it, work through them, so that we can quickly move on to the slope of enlightenment, where we can effectively use every piece of information technology to best improve our collective. So I worry, what, what do you think at this point? <coughs> computers smarter than humans? No. The humans smarter than computers? A very interesting debate we have, but also I think it is irrelevant. It's the wrong question to ask. 
because let's combine the best AI software with the best human clinical hardware, and together we can deliver better healthcare than either could alone. Thank you, everybody. We could, if anybody has a burning question or comment, you can squeeze it in now, or we can just have some more fun and do some more demonstrations. <laughs> so burning question or comment, otherwise I'm gonna carry on to the next phase. I'm also happy to catch up with you in the break afterwards. Okay. Please. What do you think is a realistic timeline for seeing some of these things? Become more, you know, like the writing the notes or some of those things. Realistic timeline. When does this, like, okay, I, I don't care about this, like, science research. When, I need help right now, right? Please, please do something, anything right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's 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 not that far, right? Most of the research I do, it's like I'm imagining five, ten years in the future. Like, whoa, this stuff has to be worked out. The kinks worked out. I think in the next year. It's not crazy, not, it's not everywhere, but a lot of clinics are gonna be using these types of tools right now. I'm trying not to name company names just for like conflict of interest, but there's the products. Um, and they need to get better, and, but very predictable, right? Don't think about where we are, think about where we're going. Is the system imperfect now? Ha ha, I caught it and made a mistake. Uh, that's not what I'm worried about. I'm thinking you can see where this is going in just a matter of years. I have, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. So this is all very good. Are there any regulations going to be in place so that it is more streamlined and we are not going off of course? Ooh, regulation. That's a tough topic. Uh, very dynamic, and I don't think there are any settled answers. In theory, if stuff is just clinical decision support, the liability is still on you. This is just thing providing information. But once it's kind of providing medical advice, arguably it probably should be regulated and the FDA, they, they just don't know how to deal with this right now. Um, you know, there's something saying like, people shouldn't even be allowed to make these models unless they have a government license. That's kind of a little crazy, actually, to even kind of control this. I would say a very unsettled issue. Really, Pandora's box just popped open like, holy crap. Really cool, but technology can move at an exponential curve. Our human institutional ability to cope with it can't move that fast. Um, there's going to be harm and disruption along the way. I am actually optimistic we will all be better off overall, eventually, on average, but there, there's gonna be bumps along the way. So this looks really good at large databases and population studies and things like that. And, and, and for some clinical data, like uh, at, um, images of derm stuff and x-rays, but the next step of like kind of integrating human touch to the individual patient, like doing a prostate exam or a breast mm -hmm. or a mm -hmm. thyroid module, are you guys working on how to integrate that with AI as well as an individual finding? There, there are people working on it. It's like it's not just the information, the decision making, the reasoning, but actually, you know, there's also like the hardware, right? You need to actually physically touch some things. Uh, I would say that's much further behind. Eventually, something will catch up. But robotics now, you're not it's not really AI. This is robotics now. is very, very difficult, mm -hmm. and it, I would say that that's much further off. Uh, we will we'll still have time for questions after, but I want to have some more fun. <laughs> Let's see how the time we got here. In here, I have the most popular toy and puzzle in history. This would of course be the Rubik's Cube. <laughs> I'm going to need a, a volunteer in a second, because many big people like played with one of these, right? But even this thing is. It's all mixed up, right? It's it's very hard to kind of use and manipulate. But if you actually just learn the right techniques combination, you actually apply pressure and then solve it. <laughs> okay, like <laughs> clearly rigged, right? I mean, come on, that wasn't real. Can I get a volunteer up on here? Probably somebody who's not solved or fixed you before. Come on up, come on up. Fantastic. We're gonna have some fun. That's because this one doesn't have stickers. This one's all, it's all in, in bed to die. Fantastic, what was your name? Jocelyn Lisa. Lisa? Jocelyn Lisa. Jocelyn Lisa, all right, fantastic. So here's what I'm gonna have you do, okay? I'm gonna, head, I'm gonna end up putting this Rubik's Cube over your head, <laughs> and then you're gonna grab the cube, and behind your back, I want you to just turn the cube. It's a very simple turn, you understand? Yeah. Don't get more complicated, it's a very simple turn. Okay. So go ahead and face the audience so they can all see you. 
Very good. And now behind your back up in and grab that tube and then just do a very slow turn. Very slow, very slow. Okay. And now I'm gonna do one myself here. And then who here is trustworthy? <laughs> Nobody. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Could you go ahead and hold on to this bag? Don't let anybody touch it. Guard it with your life. Jocelyn yeah. Easley, yes? Yeah. Never solved Rubik's Cube before? No. Yeah. What are the chances you could solve one now? You touch one before. You get to do the stickers before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wouldn't it be cool if you could learn how to do it? Yeah, that would be If you're not even sure how that happens? Yeah. Jocelyn, yeah. go ahead and show everybody how far you got. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well done. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. <laughs> Play it in the audience for sure. Right, come on. Raise your hand if you saw Ruby's Cube before. Nobody, for real. Attempted. That's shocking. Attempted. So far, get out of here. Very good, go ahead, stand here, right. face the audience. You saw Ruby's Cube, so you know what they feel like. You can confirm her, but this is Ruby's Cube. Okay, put it behind your back, same thing. And mix it up, go ahead. Keep on going, keep on going. <clears throat> What's going to happen is that you're going to say, I'm going to give you a second cube to kind of work with, all right? So keep on twisting, keep on twisting. All right, face the audience, slow down for just a second. All right, slow down, let me grab this one. Okay, now mix that one up. Tober, are you really mixing up this cube? I think so. All right, am I influencing you in some way? Am I making <laughs> you turn it in a certain direction? No. Or is it free will or illusion? <laughs> It, it, it's, it's very randomly mixed up. Sure, but it's very randomly mixed up. Does anybody have any doubt that this cube has been very thoroughly and randomly mixed up? And skeptics? No? Give it to Crystal. She's a skeptic here. We know. We know. <laughs> she likes to double check things. Let her mix it up a couple times. She's going, well, it's not get crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's, I'm going to just demonstrate many different ways that you can solve a Ruby's Cube. I'm just going to start with the standard methods so you understand how to break things down. Because everybody's played with one of these. Very few people have actually solved one. I'm surprised more people have solved it in this room. But uh, there's over 43 quintillion possible configurations of Ruby's Cube. If you brute force try to solve one configuration per second, it literally would take you longer than the history of the universe to solve Ruby's Cube. So you don't brute force solve it, you break down a complex problem into subproblems. I'm actually just solving a blue later right now, that's what I'm doing. If you do that, now things can be a lot more manageable. Now I've solved two layers of the cube. The real hard part is how do you solve the third layer by messing up the first two layers? In order to do that, you can't guess, you can't do it. You need algorithms, you need process to be able to break down complex problems into manageable solutions. Mm -hmm. Then again, then again. So you solved Ruby's Cube before. How, how did you do it? You Manual, online, YouTube, what'd you do? Um, mostly I figured out and then read a book. There you go. How long did it take you? Like two months. Okay, sure. <laughs> That's pretty reasonable. That sounds like anyone go online, find a structure map, practice for several hours. Anybody can learn how to do this, right? Standard protocol. Actually, Tober, come, come on back up. And just could you hold up this other cube so I can see it? All right, the challenge is, all right, you just slow down so I can kind of see where we're going here. In real life, there is no standard instruction manual. You need to be able to adapt to any situation you see, fluidly interact with your environment. But you can do that not just a standard solution, but what if you could match one side of the cube? <laughs> You'd be even better than matching one side, but if you match two sides of the cube, three sides, four sides, five sides, all six sides perfectly match to what you encounter on the floor. Of course, of course, this isn't magic per se. This is skill, practice, observation. Two months of my life down the drain, I'm not getting it back. <laughs> I'm having fun, it's okay. You know what would be impossible? 
impossible. What was your name? Grace. Grace, you've been holding that bag this whole time? Yeah. Has anybody gotten in there? Nope. Are you a paid actor? Do we set something up beforehand? <laughs> Good job, checks in the mail. Gilbert, go ahead and grab what's in that bag. <clears throat> go ahead and open it up and empty out what's inside. Oh boy. What are the chances, Topher? Wow. What are the chances that the cube that you mixed up oh were to match one side of the cube that was in the bag? Wow. What about two sides? Three sides, four sides, five sides, all six sides, perfectly matched. How about a hand for Topher Sharp? That was a Actually, before I do, just because uh, I know there's skeptics out here, it's it's a paper bag. <laughs> Feel free to come up here and expect yourself. Tober, did you rig this? Or, no, it's great. Did you rig this bag some way? <laughs> to doing something? Paper bag. All right, this next step is actually extremely difficult. There is a fair chance that I will screw this up, resulting in catastrophic failure and unrecoverable error. <laughs> Wait, I got a day job, y'all. I'll see what happens. I'll see what happens. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> Recycled tree pulp to transmit our missed information. I know it's crazy. Nowadays, uh, you have to consider different skills. Y'all know origami, the art of paper folding. Less than people are, it's also kirigami, where you're allowed to make a single cut through a piece of paper. If you can do that, sometimes you can make surprising shapes of her. Sometimes complexity isn't the answer. There's a famous story of Giotto. He was an artist in the Vatican. This proved to us you are a highly skilled artist, and maybe we'll hire you. He didn't draw a complex painting. <coughs> he took out a sheet of paper, and with one stroke of his pen, he was able to draw a perfect circle. I, however, am not such a well-rounded artist. Um, ask anybody who knows me, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm actually really a much more of a square. <laughs> but the problem with this act, uh, it generates a lot of trash. Uh, so make sure you recycle and recycle compost. I'm not going to turn this thing back into a train. Let's see what I got here. If you can recycle it, you can compost it, you might be able to turn something into, I don't know, kind of like, looks like a little bush at least, if not a tree. And if you nurture and take care of it, even that little tree, it might end up turning into a much bigger one. If you haven't figured it out by now, right? Obviously, I'm not actually doing magic. I'm performing illusions to illustrate things, to illustrate things that look compelling. What were you like as a kid? <laughs> <laughs> Here's my wife right here. You can ask her what. What was she thinking? I don't know. <laughs> what I'm doing is illusions. You know what real magic is? That's what you all do every day, all day. Come into every work every day, toiling and grinding, facing down nebulous bureaucracies, battling it out with confrontational situations. 
That's the real magic, to do what your patients need you to do, even at the challenge to your own well-being sometimes. So with that in mind, ooh, this is kind of hard, but we will try to get one more in here. We might just be able to. Wanted to just take this time to acknowledge Oh. <laughs> Universal Medical Partners, thank you all. Me <laughs> <laughs> and my wife, legit, this took us over an hour to make this. I hope you appreciate it. <laughs> final bit, final bit. We'll see how it goes. A little bit experimental. I'd like you to remember some picture or advertisement you see. Because what I'm about to do is to rip this piece of newspaper to shreds and then magically restore it back to the way it was. That is, of course, impossible. It would have to be some kind of trick, which it is. <laughs> The secret here that any normal magician would never tell you is that we don't actually tear the newspaper. We create only what you might call an illusion. <laughs> <laughs> This illusion is aided by not only does it look like it's being torn, it kind of even sounds like it's being torn. Hey, you can laugh, but if you didn't know better, you too could be fooled by this illusion. I've had people come to me and say, so I swear I saw there, there were several pieces of paper. What's gonna happen now is the magician's gonna have to make up some crazy story about how they're gonna slowly squeeze and, and like, Fuse this thing back into one coherent object. Ah, that of course is nonsense. It's also completely unnecessary, by the way. Well, I don't know. If you watch and stare closely, you may find that, wait a second, this newspaper was never actually torn. <laughs> out there, it's the same pictures. <laughs> it's the same advertisements. No indication that this newspaper has ever been told. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and that was Thank you so much for coming to this moment amazing. If you like this song, my name is Jonathan Chen. If you didn't like this song, my name is Super Sharp. You can fire. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Have a great day.